Thank you, Jason, for coming. So Jason uh, has been an active trampoline athlete for a number of years. Um, I'm sure he'd be better at describing his whole experience, but he's been to three Olympics, silver medal at 2008 Olympics. He has two world records, hardest routine ever competed and hardest routine ever done in training. Um, he's just recently re retired um, and moved out west. So um, I think originally we started talking, he was going to do this in the gym. And after he moved, it became a little bit more challenging. And then with the pandemic, this is just more more appropriate way to do it anyway. So, um, okay. Well, we're not allowed to to get together anymore. So <laughs> it, would, it would be really challenging, but uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us. And I'm hoping we can share even those that aren't uh, available to come today to share your story uh, later on. Um, yeah, so without further ado, Jason, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, thanks a lot, Cam. That's a very nice introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, just a heads up for anyone listening, I do have a dog here with me and she may bark. So if you hear any of that, She's just barking at the uh, maintenance guy coming in in a bit. Um, but yeah, everything Cam said was true. I've been a trampoline athlete for 24 years and I am recently retired. And I was lucky enough to attend three Olympic games. But during those, or over those three games, I had three very different experiences. And they weren't all exactly what I expected them to be, but there's definitely value in every experience that we have. And we don't always achieve the goals that we set out for ourselves, but it's up to us to decide whether or not we recognize the value in those experiences. You can't always control what happens, but you can control your perspective. But before we get into all that, we have to start right at the very beginning. And for me, that started with discovering something I was really, really passionate about. So when I was eight years old, my parents had one really important rule in our house. And that was, that was that you had to go to school, of course, but that you also had to do at least one extracurricular activity outside of school. And I didn't like this rule very much because it forced me to get out of my shell and out of my comfort zone. And I was a really shy kid, so I'd rather just sort of hang out at home and play in the backyard. Um, but that wasn't an option. Parents said you had to try something, you had to try new things, and that really was a good thing for me. So I started with swimming lessons and art classes, and then I tried gymnastics. And I decided that I liked gymnastics, so I ended up sticking with it for the next two years, sort of from ages eight to 10. But at the end of every gym class, the reward for a good training was to go jump on the trampoline. And I liked jumping on the trampoline way more than the actual gymnastics. Uh, so I told my parents this, and they helped me find a trampoline gym instead of a gymnastics gym. So I started training at a summer, or out of a summer camp uh, called Airborne Trampoline in Woodbridge. And then shortly after they started a competitive program and I was able to jump all year long, which was really, really great. And by the time I was 12, I was getting pretty good. I was getting stronger and I could jump so high that I could hang off the ceiling at Airborne. The roof was only you know, 16 feet high or something. It wasn't a huge gym. Uh, and I knew if I wanted to continue to progress in the sport, I'd need to find a gym with a higher ceiling. So I told my parents this and we found Skyriders Trampoline Place which is owned and run by Dave Ross. And that's where I was able to train for the past 20 years throughout my Olympic career. Now at Skyriders, I got to train with a lot of really great athletes and coaches. Uh, like I said, Dave, the Olympic coach, uh, ran his program out of that gym. And other athletes like Karen Coburn and Matt Turgeon, who are Canada's first Olympians, trained there as well. And I was really inspired about how high they could jump and how many flips they could do in the air. And I wanted to be just like them. And I developed this love for the sport really early on. And that allowed me to set really big goals for myself. But of course, doing what you love isn't always fun in games. And often you have to work really, really hard if you want to achieve your goals. So the next two years, I was training as Skyriders. I was learning a lot and I was having a lot of fun. I was training really hard. Uh, but when I was 14, uh, I made the first national level. and Dave was saying, okay, great, Jason, you're doing really well. You should probably be training, you know, four or five, maybe even six times a week now. There's this competition across the country we want you to go to. Like, there was just more expenses sort of adding up and up. And this was getting expensive for my parents, as it is for so many parents out there. So mine told me that I'd have to start helping to pay for training and to pay for competitions, which meant at 14, I had to get a summer job. 
Now, of course, I didn't really want to do this. I didn't want to spend my summers working, but it did make sense. And I knew that I loved trampoline and I wanted to keep doing it. So this was a sacrifice that I was willing to make. So my parents, of course, helped me out with this. When I was 14, my mom helped me get a job at her work and she was a biochemist. She worked with canola plants. Uh, so my job was to harvest the canola plants and this uh, with you know another team of young people. And they basically had these massive fields of canola plants where I would go out for eight hours a day in 30 degree weather. I'd be bending over, hunched over all day to inspect these plants and change you know bags and dirt and stuff like that. I was constantly swatting away bugs. And at least at that time, it was a really horrible experience. I didn't like it at all. And this was definitely not the way I wanted to spend my summer but I stuck it out and it was worth it because I got to train and compete for another year. I made, you know, my $500 for the summer, you know, something like that, which was a lot of money when I was 14. I'd done a really good job and my parents were able to keep me in the sport, which was great. Uh, so the next summer, uh, now I'm 15, I really didn't want to go back and work in these canola fields. So my aunt helped me get a job at her work and she had a, a managerial position at a factory that packaged a variety of different products. So my summer job at 15 was sitting on the assembly line for 10 hours a day and basically putting boxes of product into bigger boxes. It was super boring and my back got sore from sitting around all day. It's definitely not what I wanted to do with my summer. But once again, it was worth it because, you know, I made enough money to help my parents out, pay for training, pay for competitions. And it was definitely worth the sacrifice because I got to continue to do you know, what I loved, which was jumping on a trampoline for another year. So up until this point, trampoline had been going really well. You know, I'd been making enough money to continue training, competing uh, successfully and consistently. I was learning a lot and I was competing well and sort of advancing through the national levels. But when I turned 16, around age 16, that's when I faced my first really big obstacle on the trampoline. Uh, so in trampoline, when you learn skills a little too quickly, you can get the movements mixed up and perform them incorrectly. I'm sure many of you listening to this have experienced this. We call it getting lost. And it usually results in an athlete crashing or potentially hurting themselves. So I remember when I was 16, the first thing that I started getting lost on was Rudy outs, uh, which is a double front with a one and a half twist in the second somersault. And I would get stuck on the Rudy portion and basically not know where I was in the air, I'd throw my arms way out to the side and just do this big sort of Jonah back, Franny kind of thing out with my head looking everywhere, trying to figure out where I was in the air. And that prevented me from doing Rudy outs for about six months. Um, and that was a really scary experience. I just, I couldn't do the skill. I got scared and that experience kind of trickled down into other skills as well. So I ended up losing Rudy um, a really basic skill of just the front flip with a one and a half twist. And I spent many months just doing, you know, front full, falling to my butt, trying to get an extra quarter twist around, like working on these little tiny things uh, to try and, you know, piece these uh, skills back together. And then I also had trouble with half fulls and full fulls, getting stuck on the cruise. So I would end up doing a lot of granny and back outs or full in back outs. Um, and even one day I have this very vivid memory of thinking about double tuck one day when I was riding home from school on the bus and just wondering like, what do I see on a double tuck? How do I do that safely? And how do I like orient myself in the air? And I just couldn't figure it out. And just sitting on the bus, I was getting really scared about going to the gym that night. Uh, so that was, this was happening to me a lot. And I was getting really scared and really frustrated. I was crashing a lot in the gym. And even skills that I thought I had mastered, like Rudy's and double backs, you know, became really difficult for me. And I started thinking, you know, what if I get hurt? What if I can't train? What if I'm not able to walk out of the gym one day? What if I get hurt really badly? And it got so bad that I even considered quitting at one point. But I knew that I loved the sport and I knew I didn't want to give up easily. So I was willing to work hard to overcome this obstacle and sort of chip away at sort of this problem and try to get over the fear. Uh, so my coach, Dave Ross, obviously helped me a lot with this. Um, and we went back to basics. And, you know, I think that's the best thing we can do when we're in a situation like this is go back to builders and progressions 
and really focus on spotting the bed so that you are comfortable with where you are in the air and better understand every little step. And uh, I was only told this a couple of years ago, but I, I bumped into an Australian coach who, you know, we've known each other for a long time. He summed up this problem or the solution to this problem really, really well. And he said that there are no such thing as big problems. There's only small problems that compound over time. So if you can go back and fix the small problems, then you can solve the big ones. And that's exactly what Dave and I did. We sort of went back to the basics. Uh, we focused on our progressions. Like I mentioned before, for Rudy's, we did a lot of front full jump half turns, uh, front full try to squeak a little extra twist around. Um, and we did these builders for months, it felt like. It felt like forever. Um, and it was really a frustrating process. But you know, eventually over time, I got more comfortable with the simple skills, which made me a little bit more comfortable with the more difficult skills. And eventually, you know, figuring out how to do my Rudy again, feeling really good about that, figuring out how to do a double back again, feeling really good about that, and sort of building up those skills again, helped me build up the confidence. And you know, it took about six months, but I finally relearned all of the skills that I had lost. And as a reward for all of that hard work, my competition results started to improve again. Um, I was able to compete appropriate DD for my level. And I started competing at the senior national level and at the sort of end of age 16, close to age 17, I made the senior national team as well because now I was doing bigger tricks, feeling good about myself, feeling good about, uh, or feeling confident on the trampoline. And I was starting to compete better. And that was great because you know, I was getting the scores I wanted. I was going to these cool competitions. And another thing that was really nice at the time, really lucky at the time, is that I earned something called carding, which is your monthly salary to train and compete. It's a, like a government grant. Um, so thanks to all of that hard work I put in, you know, over those six months relearning skills, uh, you know, I earned a spot on team, I earned carding, and this meant that I didn't need to work a summer job to pay for trampoline anymore because now I was being Hate to jump. So all of that hard work, you know, it was tough and it was frustrating, but it really paid off in the end. And over the next couple of years, I continued to train and compete well. I continued to practice my basics. I kept all of my skills. I wasn't getting lost anymore. By the time I was 21, I qualified for my very first Olympic Games. And sort of around that time, I just started making a name for myself on the international circuit. I had, you know, placed third at a World Cup or another international meet, so people were starting to notice me, but I was still considered very much an underdog, especially at that Olympic level. So as a first time Olympian, I didn't really know what to expect, but I also knew that I wanted a medal going for the first time. That was my goal. And uh, I don't know how many of you are, know, but at the Olympics, there's only 16 athletes who compete. It's basically whittled down to a very small number from uh, the world championships the year before where you can have upwards of, you know, 100 men and maybe 80 women competing. They only take the top 16. Uh, and then they have to show their two routines, their prelim routines to the judges, and then the top eight move on to finals. And that's how you get a shot at the medals. So even just getting to the games, it's a pretty small window. And, you know, it's, you feel very lucky and very gracious just to be there having that experience. Now, of course, on the day of prelims, as a first-time Olympian, I felt very nervous. I was young. I was one of the youngest in the field. I had big expectations for myself, but routine, because of my nerves, I made a lot of mistakes and lost a lot of valuable points for poor form and traveling around the trampoline. And by the end of the very first round, I was sitting in 14th place out of 16 athletes. So this was a pretty bad spot to be in after compulsories. I needed you know, to be in the top eight to have a shot at the medals. And as we all know, every 10th counts in trampoline. And I was probably about two and a half full points you know, out of that top eight at that time. So I knew there was a big gap to fill. So I asked my coach Dave for some advice at this point. He'd been to a couple of games with Matt and Karen before. He would have a good answer. And he basically said, you know, the motto that we had created for ourselves, which was it's time to go big or go home. Now, the original plan for the optional was to do something fairly conservative. We were gonna rely on good form and good height and good control to get me through to the final. But since we'd had such a bad compulsory and we're way down in the list, just a conservative routine wasn't gonna be enough anymore. 
So we came out or came up with a new plan to basically max out our difficulty. And this is what I love to do. This was really exciting to me. Um, the year before I'd set a world record for the hardest routine done in competition. And this is where I, this was my comfort zone. Like this is what I was most confident was doing big tricks. So I wasn't allowed to take any more warm up turns, unfortunately, uh, but I could mentally visualize, you know, what this big new routine was going to do or was going to be. And I had about 20 minutes in between compulsory and optional. So I went back to the training hall just to visualize my new routine before my, my turn. Now in the training hall, you know, I really got into the zone. I'd had a, a whole sort of um, idea of how I wanted to picture the routine. I had uh, like a visualization practice that I'd done where I'd close my eyes and I'd think about the sensation of the skill and go through the routine that way. But then I'd also stand on the spot and sort of raise my arms to set and get into pipe positions or tuck positions, depending on what skill I was do, doing or twisting to kind of you know, feel, once again, generate that sensation of flipping. And that's how I would remind myself, okay, here's what we're gonna do in this big new routine. And this obviously takes a lot of effort, a lot of focus. And I ended up losing track of time while I was in there, um, just really getting into the zone, thinking about what I'm gonna do next. And then all of a sudden Dave comes, he kicks down the door basically, comes running into the gym and says, what the hell are you doing? You're up, let's go. So I, I'm sort of pulled out of my, my focus for a moment. I'm a little confused. And then only then do I realize, you know, I take a look at the, the television screen that has the competition on live. And I realize that the Japanese athlete who competes right before me, he's already halfway through his routine. And I'm not even in the same building right now. Like I'm across the road. So we, the only thing we can do is we start to sprint. We run out of the training hall, back across the path, back into the Olympic stadium, and we're jumping over gymnastics equipment just to get to the trampolines on time. And we get there just as the Japanese athlete is walking off the trampoline. And he's got a big smile on his face. He's done a great routine, qualified for the finals. Meanwhile, I'm there and I'm clutching my heart and I'm catching my breath and like I'm exhausted from this run. And I'm thinking about everything that has gone wrong you know, with the, the bad compulsory, the missing my turn, this, you know, changing of the, the routine at the very last second. But as I get up on the trampoline, you know, I've got all these negative thoughts floating in my head. But, you know, as I turn to the judges and get ready to start my routine, one final thought enters my mind. And that was that I have to do the best routine of my life right now. There's, there's no other choice. So I started jumping high. I started jumping really high. So I know the first couple skills are gonna be really cru crucial. Um, the routine originally started with a trip pike and then a Miller tuck, but now we're doing trip pike Miller plus, which is a quadruple twisting double back. And that's where a lot of the DD is coming from. It's a really big combination. If it goes well, that could be a really good thing, but there's a lot of mistakes that could be made as well. Uh, but I get through the first couple skills well in the box, they're high, they're clean. I keep going through the routine. I start seeing little opportunities where I can, you know, add a twist to this flip. I put a Miller in the middle. I end with a half Randy just to get as much DD as possible anywhere I can. And on the 10th skill, I kill the bounce. I'm dead center of the trampoline. You know, things had finally gone right. And thankfully the judges agreed with me that things had gone right. And when I got off the trampoline and sat down with Dave to receive our scores, we ended up with the highest scoring optional of the day. And when you combine my really low compulsory score with my really high compul optional score, I managed to squeak into finals in seventh place. So this was this experience, it filled me with confidence. And I, was, I felt very lucky, but I felt very excited. And I felt like I had the ability, you know, to compete with some of the best athletes in the world. So on the day of finals, I believed that I could be on that podium. And, you know, I came to the gym that day, everything went according to plan. I focused on my skills. I hit the routine of my life and I ended up walking away with a silver medal. So that was, that was an amazing first Olympic experience, especially as a first time uh, Olympian. And I succeeded because I loved what I was doing. I was excited about what I was doing. And that passion motivated me to work hard every step of the way along the journey and then to take risks in pursuit of my goals 
you know, to cross the finish line. But winning can also have a negative effect on us as well. Like I said, I was only 21 when I won my first Olympic medal, or when I won my Olympic medal, and I became pretty overconfident afterwards. Uh, and over the next four years, I would learn that this attitude, it does not help your performance at all. And also that if you start resting on your accomplishments and thinking that, you know, you don't need to work hard anymore, other athletes or other competitors are going to surpass you. So like I said, winning an Olympic silver medal was a great experience, but there were three negative things that came from it. Number one was I became very overconfident. I thought I was great and I didn't need any help from anyone anymore. Uh, number two, I was proud. I thought I knew best and I forgot how many people had actually contributed to my success and got me to that podium. And number three, I became a little lazy. I thought now that I've achieved this level of you know, Olympic silver medalist, I thought I would always be there and that I didn't need to train as hard or as much anymore to maintain that level. I thought I was, you know, I'm ahead of the pack already. I'll always be there. I've done it. But as a result, my ability to work as a team suffered greatly. So over the next two years, I had pretty average results. You know, I wasn't doing as much in training. I wasn't listening to my coach. I was just doing what I wanted to do and thinking that that would be enough. Uh, but because of this, the rest of the trampoline community, they started to catch up. People who I considered myself better than, which was untrue, you know, they caught up to me, they started to beat me. And, you know, at this time, I should have recognized that resting on this accomplishment of winning a silver medal, um, you know, isn't going to keep me there all the time. And when you do rest on those types of accomplishments or stop working hard in pursuit of your goals, unforeseen obstacles can all of a sudden creep up and get in your way. Uh, so in 2010, you know, I started to get my act back together. I was starting to realize this. I was seeing other athletes catch up to me, beat me, which was, you know, that was good for my training because I started taking things seriously again. Uh, and I, I started strong. I set a new world record at a World Cup in Switzerland for a degree of difficulty. But then something unexpected happened. An unexpected obstacle sort of popped up and got in my way. So one of the things that I, I loved to do at the time when I'm not jumping on the trampoline was practice parkour and free running. And for those of you who don't know, parkour and free running is all about getting from one place to another in the most creative way possible. And it involves running, flipping, tumbling, martial arts, all stuff like that. Um, and in 2010, these skills helped me get hired as a stuntman in film and television. And I was just really enjoying that side of things. Um, and these were really cool experiences. So I, I wanted to make a demo reel that showcased some more of my, you know, parkour free running or stunt like abilities so that hopefully I can get more work in film and television. But as I was filming some stuff one day, I ended up breaking my leg. I was trying to do a double side flip off a four foot box on a gymnastics floor. I landed short and I was still all tucked and I felt my leg bend, you know, in a place where there was no joint, sort of in the shin area, it felt really weird. Um, there wasn't pain at first, but it came pretty quickly afterwards. And, you know, initially I was hoping, okay, maybe I've just sprained something. It won't be that bad. So I tried to, you know, get up and stand on it and immediately collapsed because it was so painful. And then at that point, I knew something was seriously wrong. So we got an x-ray and it showed that I'd broken my fibula and dislodged or dislocated my ankle. And this meant that I needed surgery to re repair the damage and I needed six months to recover. So a few days later, we had the surgery. They put a big screw through my ankle joint and another seven screws in a plate held my fibula together. And after three weeks, the doctors, you know, were gonna do a little checkup to see how everything was healing. They were expecting that the skin should have healed nicely and, you know, we could move on to some physiotherapy at that point. So they cut off the cast, they removed the bandages. And then I noticed the doctor, he's kind of looking disappointed and shaking his head. So I looked down at the incision and I see that it's become infected. This all happened in the summer, so I was, uh, I was crutching around outside and I was just, you know, leg was getting sweaty and drooping into the cast and it was, it was not a good situation. And because of this, because of the infection, there was a part of the incision that hadn't healed and there was actually a big hole sort of over the, the surgical area and you could see down to where the screw heads were on the leg. Like it was just this big gaping hole. Uh, and because of this, I had to postpone physiotherapy. We had to wait until that healed up. And that took at least another three weeks. So 
after a few more weeks go by, you know, we've got antibiotics now. We have a nurse checking up on me regularly, changing the bandages, making sure everything heals properly. That hole heals up. I'm getting ready to start physio. But then a couple days after, you know, I think things are gonna about to get going, I notice at the top of the incision, there's a bunch of swelling and it's turning bright red. And it's getting pretty sore as well to the touch. So I just kind of leave it for now, but a few days later I wake up and I remove the bandages to see how, this, how the area is doing. And I notice that it's like the swollen area has burst now and there's blood just pouring out of my leg. So I call the team doctor, I explain the situation. She basically tells me the best thing to do at this point is to let the blood drain, so let it bleed, and then bandage yourself back up and we'll bring you in tomorrow to check it out. Um, and that all had to be done pretty quickly because I was also writing an exam for school that day, which was super fun, not stressful at all. That's a lie. Um, but anyway, I managed to get my leg under control. I write my exam. I meet the surgeon the following day. He checks everything out and says that I'd had another sort of reaction, like a minor infection to the internal stitches. So this left, which left another gaping hole in my leg. Fantastic. Uh, and this also forced me to postpone physiotherapy another three weeks. So you can imagine my ankle has been in a cast, immobilized for six weeks now, maybe even seven. You know, there's a lot of muscle atrophy. There's a lot of work to be done. Mobility is terrible because it's been stuck in one, in one place for a long time. And I've got this incision that won't heal. But, you know, eventually it does. We probably spent, you know, six, seven, eight weeks waiting for the incision to heal, which is way too long. Incision should really take only about two weeks. Um, and then after that, we slowly progressed through physiotherapy, through weight bearing, walking, working out. And I spent about four months rehabbing, regaining strength and mobility. Um, but, you know, during all this time, my competitors were able to keep training at a very high level. They were improving, they were learning new tricks, they were getting stronger. And then in November, I went to see my surgeon because I was gonna make an appointment to take out some of the hardware uh, in the leg. The screw in my ankle joint needed to come out so I could regain full mobility. But he kind of surprised me that day and decided just to cut me open right there in the sport med clinic. Uh, he numbed my ankle with some local anesthetic and then made an incision with a scalpel and jammed a screwdriver into my leg and basically just twisted out the screw in the ankle and then stitched me back up. And unfortunately, I guess I was doing, because of the weight training and the, the rehab I was doing at the time, there was pressure on the screw. So it ended up breaking in half in the ankle. So we only got about half of it, but it was enough to like regain full mobility. And you know, that part of the screw will just be in my leg forever, uh, which is fine. It hasn't caused me any problems since, but once again, another minor surgery made, uh, meant that I needed about another six weeks to recover before I could actually get back on the trampoline. So by the time the whole ordeal was over, it had been about six months off to recover from this broken leg, which is a huge chunk of time. And this was a really big and unforeseen obstacle that cost me a ton of time, which my competitors used to train, to get better, to get stronger, to learn new skills, you know, basically just to pass me. So, now the 2012 Olympics are, they're only a year and a half away and I've got a lot of work to do to catch up to all these other athletes who you know, are doing some pretty impressive stuff now. So the first step on the road to the 2012 Olympics is to qualify a spot. And there are two ways to do this. Uh, if you're in the top eight at the world championships the year before, so in 2011, you would earn a spot immediately. And if you're between uh, places nine and 24 at the world championships, you'd have to go to a second competition which is called the Olympic test event, and then try to get into the top eight. So you have that total of 16 athletes again. And if you don't do either of these things, that's it for you. You just have to wait another four years. So it's a pretty, you know, tight, uh, it's, a, it's a high bar to meet and it's really tough to do. And my goal was basically just to place in the top eight of the world championships and try and secure my Olympic spot right away. But I was just returning to sport, you know, a few months, maybe I'd been on the trampoline for four or five months, you know, after my broken leg. And when you're returning after an injury, your body doesn't always cooperate the way you want it to, um, which led to another unforeseen obstacle, which ate up a bunch of time. So one day I was training and I started to feel a bruising sensation in the arch of my foot, on the bottom of my foot. And it wasn't very painful, so I ignored it for a few days, but it persisted. So I went to my sport doctor and she took a look and she said that I developed plantar fasciitis. 
don't know if anyone out there has had this before, but it's pretty uncomfortable. It feels like a big bruising sensation on the bottom of your foot. And basically, your plantar fascia is soft tissue that connects your five toes to your heel. And when you have plantar fasciitis, you have micro tears in the plantar fascia, in that soft tissue. So sport doctor said that there's probably no risk of you actually tearing through your plantar fascia um, because most people who do that have it for, month, for many months, but I'd only had it for a week or something. But I guess you didn't consider that the amount of pressure, or didn't consider the amount of pressure on your feet when you jump on a trampoline and you're jumping 25 feet high over and over again. So I spent a few more weeks training, getting a little more uncomfortable every day. I went to a competition in Denmark. It was a World Cup. And in the middle of my routine, my plantar fascia tore in half. And it felt like there had been like an elastic band that snapped on the inside of my foot underneath, the, in between my toe and my heel. And I didn't really understand what had happened at the time. It felt like, the, like a trampoline string had snapped underneath my foot. It was really weird. And it, it didn't hurt immediately, but I stopped just because I thought, like, is the equipment broken? Is it safe? But as, you know, seconds after I stopped jumping, I felt the pain in my foot start to, you know, spike really quickly. And, you know, I took a few steps to test it out and then realized I, I can't walk. Like, this isn't working. This is way too painful. So I limped off the trampoline. My coach sort of put the arm, like, under the shoulder and supported me back to the bench. Um, and this, this was a huge problem. Like, I didn't know what to do about this. And when I got home, I was basically put in a cast for another three weeks and told that I had to take more time off. And this was a big problem because the Olympic qualifier, the official one, the world championships, um, was only about a month away. So by the time I recovered enough to get back on a trampoline, I had about a single one week to train for worlds and to train for that Olympic qualifier. Now, in November, we flew to England for that competition, and this was the first big Olympic qualifier, and I knew that if I placed in the top eight, Canada would be guaranteed an Olympic spot. But, of course, I ended up placing ninth, 0 0.3 out of that top eight goal. And because I was only 0 0.3 away and outside the top eight, that meant that Canada's Olympic spot was not secure for the time, and I'd have to try again at the second competition and compete at the Olympic test event. Now, luckily, the Olympic test event was two months away, so I took a little more time off to help my foot heal, and, you know, that made a big difference. The pain decreased, but didn't go away. We were taping a lot to sort of help things out, help support the foot, and I was able to place fourth at that competition, which did end up earning Canada an Olympic spot. And then I would spend the next eight months training with the goal of becoming, if not an Olympic medalist, an Olympic champion. I said, I had big goals again. You know, I've been a silver medalist already. I was looking for the top spot now. But due to those unforeseen obstacles I encountered, encountered along the way, I just didn't seem to have enough time to get back to where I wanted to be for those 2012 Olympics. I was still a strong competitor, but there were other athletes who had stayed focused for the last four years, made huge improvements, learned new skills, doing bigger, better routines, and they were just overall better prepared because they hadn't you know, they hadn't taken time off, they hadn't lost focus and got lazy in practice. And I still had a strong prelim. I was ranked sixth going into the finals, but in finals I ended up crashing and I had to settle for eighth place. So I didn't get to achieve my goal of winning a second Olympic medal and I had to settle for less. And I think this is, you know, this comes down to developing a bad attitude after my win in Beijing. I got a little bit lazy in training and then when I started working hard again, unforeseen obstacle, obstacles got in my way and stalled my progress. And I didn't have enough time to catch up to my rivals and my other competitors, and this ultimately prevented me from achieving my goal. So I didn't like this feeling. I don't think anybody would. And I didn't want to repeat this performance. So by the time I left London in the 2012 Olympics, I was already thinking about the next four years. So I got a taste of what it was like to crash and burn at that competition. I didn't like it at all. So over the next two years, I put in a really solid effort. I was competing new routines with big difficulty. I had no injuries. I'd recovered from everything. And I was getting back on the podium at some World Cups. But I was still too proud, and I was still wasn't working well uh, with my team, especially my coach. And this was not an ideal attitude, and it's something that would have to change. 
And my experiences over the next few years would really come to show me the true value of teamwork and how important that is to achieving your goal. So in October of 2014, I was training for the World Championships. The 2016 Olympics were only two years away and I wanted to get back on the podium. Now one day I was training and I lost focus and I crashed. I was working on my optional and you know I had started with a Rudia trip pike, half trip pike, trip pike, did all the hard stuff and then I was onto the half half pike and thought, oh, this will be easy. Like it's a really simple skill after all these triples. That's the one that ended traveling all the way to the end of the trampoline. I had this bad habit of like doing a quarter turn and coming down on my side. You know, it had been fine up until this point, but on today, the landing was just a little bit off. I landed with my legs on the mat, my body on the trampoline, came down at just the wrong angle. And I felt this release sensation in my knee. It was a pretty jarring crash, didn't look very nice. Um, and I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what but that release sensation didn't feel like a good thing. And this really marked the beginning of my most challenging Olympic journey. So my teammates helped me off the trampoline. They called the team doctor. She orders an MRI. We get the results a few days later. And the results was that I had torn my ACL. So for people who don't know, your ACL is a, a major lead lig knee ligament bleh, that connects your femur and your tibia and fibia. So it's like a, a very tight, piece of tissue that connects your the upper leg bone to your two bottom leg bones. And without it, the knee joint becomes very unstable and puts you at risk of further injury, especially when you're trying to jump on a trampoline and trying to go 25 feet high and do all these different flips. Stability is key. You really want to have a lot of it and you want to be strong. Um, but that MRI result didn't just show a torn ACL. There were a few other things wrong with my knee. And I've got the list here. Uh, let's see, it starts with torn ACL, but includes second degree MCL tear, tibial plateau fracture, partial PCL tear, lateral meniscus tear, medial men meniscus tear, patella dislocation, tibial bone bruise, tibial hairline fracture, patella tendonitis, shearing of the fat pad, partial tearing of the soleus, and massive swelling throughout the joint. So obviously, pretty terrible injury. And this meant that I needed surgery and about eight to 10 months of recovery. This is worse than just breaking a bone, far worse. And this news, it scares me. I'd have to go eight to 10 months without trampoline. And the Olympic qualifier was just over a year away. So what if, you know, I wouldn't be able to train for most of that year. And I was really wondering, what if that wouldn't be enough? You know, I'd always wanted to go to three games and I was hoping, you know, for three medals. You know, this is gonna be my last chance. Now I couldn't solve this problem on my own and I needed to rely on my team for guidance and support. And it started out with the most obvious stuff. You know, my surgeon needed to repair my ACL. Then I needed my physiotherapist, athletic therapist, osteopaths. They all helped me recover from the surgery and regain uh, mobility and strength. Uh, my strength and conditioning coaches and Pilates coaches helped me rebuild more strength on top of that, flexibility. Um, and we focused on recovery for about a full eight months. Uh, and that took us all the way to June of 2015. And I was ready to get back on the trampoline at this point. Uh, but this was still a pretty quick uh, recovery for an ACL. Usually they recommend taking almost a full year off. But because, you know, Olympic qualifiers were coming up, Pan Am Games were coming up, you know, we rushed a little bit to try and get, my, get me back in shape for some of these competitions. So that summer, I was able to compete at the Pan Am Games. And I even won the national championships, which was a really great sign. I thought my, you know, my training continued to progress and I was looking forward to the first Olympic qualifier in November. I was feeling happy and healthy and strong. And I felt like I'd made a full recovery. And that was all thanks to my team of people, my therapists, my coaches, all working together. Uh, and we've done it just in time for this Olympic qualifier coming up in November. But one day in September, so a few months before, I felt my knee wobble while I was jumping. And it didn't hurt very much. So I was able to, you know, I finished my routine that turn. I was able to continue my practice. Um, but, it, you know, the next day my hamstring was really, really sore. So I had to take a couple of days off just to recover from that. Um, but that went away and everything felt normal again. I thought, oh, this is fine. Just a weird little, you know, hiccup along the way. But this 
like sensation of instability kind of kept happening over and over again. And every time it happened, my hamstring would be really, really sore the next day. And I'd have to take, you know, two days off here, a week off there to recover. And we couldn't really explain it at the time. We weren't sure what was going on. Um, so the physios, the athletic therapists, the osteos, they, they, they didn't have a good reason for why this was happening. So we get in touch with the sport doctor and we request an MRI. And it can take a little while to get an MRI sometimes. So we, we eventually get the test and we get the results four days before we leave for the Olympic qualifier for the world championships. And the results of that MRI is that I've torn my ACL again. Somehow, you know, probably due to the quick recovery, um, the ligament was still weak and due to trampoline training and traveling around the trampoline and really trying to be stable, um, it just ended up re-injuring the knee. And when I hear this news, I'm shocked. I'm back at the beginning. I need another surgery. Recovery is another eight to 10 months, but the Olympic qualifier is only four days away right now. There's enough time for surgery or for all to take that time off. I remember, you know, getting that phone call and just sort of wandering around downtown a little bit because, you know, I could still walk relatively comfortably. There was some swelling in my knee, but because my legs were so strong, they could keep the joint stable, you know, just doing simple things like walking. But my muscles weren't strong enough to keep it stable when we were jumping on a trampoline uh, and doing all these flips, jumping 25 feet high. Um, so I ended up calling my therapist that day and explaining what has happened and they're shocked as well. But, you know, this is where, you know, my team really came together and really pulled through and really made, you know, achieving these goals possible is that uh, the therapist came up with a new idea and they said that they could stabilize my knee with a tape job. And that potentially could be enough, you know, to get me through this competition, get me through this Olympic qualifier. And since we only had four days, a quick fix would have to do. Um, so that's what we went with. Uh, but this obstacle wasn't just physical. There was also this huge mental component as well, because now I had to trust that a little piece of tape was going to prevent my knee from collapsing while I jumped 25 feet high on a trampoline. And just thinking about this really scared me, um, because if, you know, if that happened, I could damage more things in my knee. There could be permanent damage. There could be more time off. I could just miss the Olympics right then and there. Um, so that mental component was very scary. And I had to rely on my team for a lot of support mentally and physically to get me through this, you know, this next week, um, and this next Olympic qualifier. So four days later, we traveled to, to England for this competition. And my team supported me the entire way there. They, they helped me stay focused on training and on competition and sort of, you know, kept my knee stable. My athletic therapist, they taped my knee every single day and reassured me it was going to be ready to go. My coach stood by the trampoline and held up the mat for safety in case anything went wrong. And all of these things really helped with my mental and physical preparation. They were all really, really necessary. Uh, and thanks to my team, I ended up placing 18th at those world championships, which based on that qualification process, that was enough to qualify a spot for Canada at the Rio Olympics. So I trained for another eight months without the ACL. We had decided that, you know, there's definitely no time for surgery and we're sort of on the road to the games. We just have to keep going without it. Um, and I ended up completing the qualification process but every day was a huge challenge to keep my knee stable and to keep it pain free. And, you know, I felt like we spent a good four months just experimenting with different tape jobs, different types of braces, and, you know, things would be okay for a week. And then I'd get another wobble and a lot of hamstring pain and I'd have to take time off. And we just kept trying to, you know, build up new routines, build up bigger tricks while struggling with this, instability in the knee and we could never really tell when it would come, when it would go, when it would be a good day, when it would be bad. Uh, the, um, the uncertainty of it all was really, really difficult to deal with because I just wanted to go in and have a good practice and, you know, start chipping away at the goals I'd set for myself, going to the Olympics, getting onto the podium. But every couple of days, every week, there'd be a new setback in the form of the knee wobbling, the pain in my hamstring, you know, there's always something. So really, um, in the end, just getting to the Olympics was a huge victory in itself. Um, 
And I always kind of had these dream scenarios in my head where I would get back to the podium. Um, but those weren't always realistic. So really like just getting to the Olympics was such a huge deal at the time. Um, and on the day of competition at the 2016 Olympics, you know, I was feeling good. My knee was taped well together. I could do the tape job myself. I had a lot of trust in it. We figured out a good strategy. I had a pretty strong compulsory, but I struggled with instability on the optional. And because of that, I ended up placing 14th out of 16 athletes, which was really far from sort of the medal scenario that I'd been dreaming about. Uh, but I don't remember Rio for the results. I remember Rio because my team helped me overcome numerous obstacles and together we earned a chance to represent Canada at the Olympic Games. So sport has been a huge part of my life and over the past three Olympics I've had three very different experiences. They weren't all what I expected them to be but there's value in every single one of them. My Beijing Olympic experience taught me that it's worth taking risks, uh, it's worth working hard and taking risks in pursuit of your passion. My London experience taught me that you must always work hard to achieve your goals. And if you rest in your accomplishments, others will surpass you. And my Rio experience taught me that teamwork really does make the dream work. And asking for help is not a weakness, it's a strength. And behind every individual, there are numerous people who help contribute to their success. So we all have good days, we all have bad days. We win, we lose, we succeed, we fail. But when you choose to see the value in each one of those experiences, that's when the experience becomes more important than the medals. And that is my Olympic talk. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have now. I don't know if Cameron Leo want to moderate that a little bit. I'll let them. Uh, 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 pin. Hey, Cam. <laughs> Sorry, I was just unpinning you so I can see. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much, Jason. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, I'd like to open up for questions. I wrote down a couple of, of questions that uh, uh, I'd like to ask, but I'll, I'll open up to the athletes first. Does anyone want to ask Jason a question? This is kind of a really unique opportunity to ask someone, uh, Jason, a question. So would anyone like to? Yeah, and it doesn't just have to be a Olympic stuff either. If there's, you know, skill problems or anything like that, anything trampoline related, Happy to try and help out. I'm not sure that everyone's being pretty, sh pretty shy. I'll ask a question. Perfect. So yeah. I'm not a trampoline athlete. I used to be a gymnast growing up, though. Um, and I remember really struggling with mental blocks, kind of how you described in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is like? how do you overcome mental blocks with skills? Yeah, so for me, the, the most helpful component was figuring out how to spot the trampoline at strategic moments throughout each skill. And every skill, there's you know slightly different moments, but there's kind of like an internal logic um, within trampoline skills where there's similarities. So like if I'm doing a flippus or a half out, you know, I can leave the trampoline and spot the trampoline as I leave. Then I'm over my head as I'm flipping forwards. But as soon as I come to that one and a quarter sort of somersault position, my face is now looking at the trampoline again. And I can take a look at the trampoline before I start <coughs> the branding portion of the skill. And that tells me exactly where I am in the air. And I focused a lot on, you know, exactly that. Sort of figuring out when I was able to see the trampoline. Um, and that told me where I was in the air. But also, in addition to that, <clears throat> there are blind spots in every trampoline skill as well, where our, our head isn't facing the trampoline. Or in particular, when we're doing twisting skills like Rudy, you're double full, and we're twisting so fast that everything's a bit of a blur. So it's not only just having the time to look at the trampoline to tell you where, in the air, where you are in the air, but also accepting that there will be blind spots and there will be times where you just don't get to see the trampoline and you have to rely on the sensation in the air to tell you exactly where you are. And it was the combination of those two things, sort of spotting the trampoline and then accepting the blind spot um, and understanding where those moments were in each skill that helped me sort of build out the confidence I needed to perform all the different tricks. Awesome. Anybody? Well, I guess I'll, 
I, I'll ask a question now, uh, sort of on behalf. We have a lot of uh, um, older athletes, like adult athletes. And I'm just wondering, um, just because a common time when, you know, athletes um, have a harder time staying motivated uh, just because, you know, responsibilities as an adult or there's so many other things going on in their lives and a lot of their teammates may, you know, move on from the sport. What kept you motivated? You were an adult athlete for like 15 years. What kept you motivated through those years to keep training? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, what kept me motivated was having not only just the big goals, such as going to the Olympics or getting to a podium, but, you know, all the small goals that kind of led up to that big one. So, like, I was always excited to compete. Um, I wanted to do well at competition. So even if it was just the provincial meet, you know, I had a goal of, you know, doing this routine and doing it, you know, so well. It wasn't necessarily I just want to win and be on the podium, but it was I want to achieve a certain score um, or I want to use this trick. So there became all of a sudden like a lot of strategy involved in how I built out my routines. You know, I would look at the different degrees of difficulty I was capable of, what kind of height scores I needed, what kinds of form scores I need to achieve. Let's say I wanted to score 61 points. I would do all the math, I'd figure it out. I'd tinker with it in practice because of course the very first sort of strategy you come up with isn't necessarily going to be the one that gets you there. Um, and I always really enjoyed the, the strategy side of things. Um, just trying to figure out how I could get myself to the next level, whether it was you know, at a provincial meet, a national meet, or a big international meet. Um, another thing I always did too is I loved watching videos. Like I would YouTube trampoline videos. I'd watch old competition videos just to see what other people were doing, get ideas for routines, get ideas for skills, whether it was, you know, a new skill completely or just a different style of doing a trick, whether you're, you know, yeah, like I, I just loved all of that. So watching the videos, coming up with a strategy for how to push myself forwards is what kept me motivated. Does anyone else have any questions for Jason? I just had a question. You were talking about that you got really nervous uh, whenever you used to compete. How would yeah. you like calm down your nerves and kind of just let yourself relax a little bit? Yeah, so that was something I always kind of struggled with. But I think um, one thing that really helped me is just accepting that you're going to be nervous and that being nervous isn't a bad thing. So you almost have to lean into it a little bit. Because um, for me, what nerves, what nerves tell me is that I care about what I'm doing. So that's all of a sudden a really positive thing now. So if I, if I care about what I'm doing, it's good to be nervous. So that's sort of step one, I think, anyway. It's good to be nervous. Step two is, yes, you do need to control those nerves a little bit or use them to your advantage anyway. Um, so one thing I would do is I'd like to really like survey the scene first. So I'd kind of wander around the competition floor. I'd look at the crowd. I'd look at the judges. I'd look at the other athletes. Um, just to like see who's there. So there were like, there were no surprises when I got up on the trampoline. I didn't want to like turn and see the judges for the first time and go, oh my God, they're judges. That's so scary, right? So I would kind of get myself used to that. Um, but then I'd, I'd want a little bit of adrenaline as well. I always found that really helpful um, and it would make me forget about the nerves a little bit. But I also think like that sensation of adrenaline, like if you really think about it, it's kind of like, it's similar to nerves, right? So being nervous is like, priming you for that like boost of adrenaline right which i think we all get when we step on a trampoline anyway so if you can you know get excited about what you're doing um and yeah be really pumped up to get on the trampoline and to like to show them something that's gonna surprise them impress them something like that like, that's when i always did my best um and one way i kind of generated that for myself sort of in the the 2008 example was if i decided I want to do a crazy hard routine today, I'd get super pumped about, you know, I'm changing the plan. I'm going to try something crazy and that's going to be awesome. And now I'm ready to go. You know, and I don't, I don't recommend that every time because changing your plan at the last minute isn't always a, uh, you know, a recipe for success, but it's just an example of how, you know, you can start to boost your own adrenaline. But I think that's, you know, the really, that's the challenging mental component of competing well is figuring out how you could boost your adrenaline without you know taking unnecessary risks like changing the routine at the very last moment <laughs> great uh anyone else have a, a question 
Um, could you talk a little bit more about when you were learning like full out and half full? Because I think you said you struggle with that, and I'm kind of struggling with that too right now. Yeah, for sure. So when I was learning things like full out or half full or full full, the thing that I got really stuck on was the cruise portion. So like that stomach drop, half turn to stomach drop. We do a really similar motion on full out where you start with your, your back foot, but then you cruise, you spot the trampoline, and you granny. That gets you to your full out. Similar to half full, you granny, cruise. That gets you to your stomach, sort of facing position, and then you granny down. And for me, I could do the granny portion, but then my shoulders would get stuck in the cruise, and I'd throw my head back and start looking for the trampoline, just go over backwards. So for me, I ended up doing a lot of cruises. I ended up doing a lot of like cruise duck under, so like uh, Arabians off your stomach, a lot of Cody fulls, that kind of thing, because that was a very similar movement. And I put a lot of focus on, you know, almost pulling my shoulders around so that I would start to generate that cruise as soon as I was done the either the three quarter back portion or the granny or the full in, you know, whatever it's, you know, whatever skill you're going for. For me, the key was the cruise because I needed to move my shoulders to start that twist. But also as soon as you do the cruise, you're looking at the trampoline. Now you know where you are in the air and you just have a brandy to go. Um, so me, I just focused on that a lot. And I found that really helpful because I, you know, I got my half full and full full back in a couple days after I sort of developed that mindset. But then I realized, okay, now that I'm at this cruise portion, I can brandy, I can Rudy, I can Randy, like I can do all these things as long as I see the trampoline after the cruise. And Miller's, Miller Plus, Full Randy, Full Rudy, all came pretty quickly afterwards once I'd figured out Randy Cruise. Um, so one thing, if you're struggling with things like Full Out, do lots of um, like one and a quarter back cruise to stomach. Do it on the mat, do it to the trampoline, make it a skill you're so comfortable with, you can do it anywhere. Um, or at any time, any height, any position. Same with Branny cruise to stomach, full cruise to stomach. Because then the next step is really just spot the trampoline, duck under for the, the, the duck under progression, or Branny down for the complete skill. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I had I had one question that I sort of thought of, but we can open it up right after. But I was just. I'm thinking that now it's sort of similar to what you went through with your ankle and your knee where these athletes are, you know, it's being taken away from them, the opportunity to train. Um, some of them have we've been off since last March uh, just because they haven't been comfortable coming back to the gym. Um, I'm just wondering some words of advice for how to stay motivated and how to really focus on the big picture and not just, you know, I have to go back, I have to relearn everything, you know, I'm, I'm, weaker i'm i forget how to do certain things like what what, what kind of kept me motivated to keep going um even though you know that people are surpassing you and and uh they're able to train when you're not right um uh, well, i think at this time like a lot of people are in similar circumstances <clears throat> where they're not able to train in the same way so you may not be as far behind as you realize but also taking time off i always found was a great way for me to sort of get over bad habits I developed as I was training. Because when I was off recovering, I'd always think about these great routines I wanted to do when I got back to training. And I'd think about how good they would be, which you know was maybe my pride coming through a little bit, but I'd think about all, like I always saw the most ideal version of the skill. I never imagined doing skills with bad habits or bad form. So that became my focus for months at a time were these like picture perfect skills. So when I'd come back to the trampoline, or after my recovery, some of the bad habits that I developed when I was training regularly before the injury almost seemed to like start to get better on their own because I wasn't thinking about them anymore, right? I was only thinking about how to do the skill really well. And when we come back from this pandemic, you know, hopefully it's, it's not too much longer, you know, yes, we're gonna be a little weaker, we're not gonna jump as high, we're not gonna have all our skills, but that's a great, you know, time to sort of rebuild some of the basics. If there's something that you struggled with before, you haven't made that you know, same mistake for months and months now, right? You can start to forget about that mistake and figure out you know, what's gonna be a better way to perform that builder, that skill, that whatever it is, right? You can start to make changes. 
and just thinking really positively and imagining and visualizing all of these great routines and great skills that you're going to do when you get back to training, right? It's going to happen. You know, having that positive mental picture right now is going to make a difference in your training when you're able to get back to the gym. Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I was just gonna say, um, what are you doing now? Like, how's retirement? Are you still involved with trampoline? Do you coach? Yeah, so um, I've been doing a little bit of stunt work here in Vancouver. Um, I have been coaching at a gym called Shasta out here and another gym uh, called Tag, uh, just a couple local gyms, um, and jumping once a week just for fun. I've also started doing my Pilates certification because that was a really um, important part of my training sort of for 12 years during my Olympic career. Um, and I always really enjoyed that style of workout. So I've been teaching that to athletes here and to you know friends and family as I sort of go through the course. Um, but ideally, you know, I'll become certified within the next few months. And then I'd love to work with athletes to you know build strength and stability and flexibility through that style of workout, whether it's you know with trampoline or other sports. Um, so I'm looking at that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I feel like I'm very much in the, the transition phase of, you know, I used to be an athlete. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to be after that, but I'm trying a bunch of different things, um, which, and I like them all. I'm passionate about them all. So I'm excited to do all of these things, which I think is always a really positive uh, outlook to have because it's, you know, when you're passionate about something, when you like doing things, you're just going to work a little bit harder at them. And the harder you work, the closer to success you become. Has, has per performing ever crossed your mind, like like Cirque or anything like that? Uh, it did, but I always imagined that Cirque was like if I if I retired younger, you know, I would have done Cirque. Okay. But right now, with uh, you know my fiance and a dog and a mortgage, like it doesn't make sense. Right. Well, and the pandemic, of course, too, it doesn't make sense to try to right. work now. Um, the stunt industry and the film industry is very different. Like they are able to hire their own um, like COVID testing, like private COVID testing centers. So there's still lots of film happening in and around here. And, you know, I got a bit of it. I'm still very much at the beginning of that. So I don't do a ton yet, but you know, the film industry is, it's local, it's exciting. It's a version of performing. You know, I need to learn a few different skills to really fit in with it, like the fighting and falling portion of it. But, you know, it's a, it's a cool outlet for my acrobatic ability. Yeah, cool. All right, and anyone else? I had one question. Um, you said that you made national team when you were like 16. How were you able to balance like school and training like five times a week yeah <laughs> um so that was difficult I'll, I'll be honest i was never a great student I, like i was a pretty solid c maybe b minus student in high school and that was definitely because i put more of my focus on trampoline um <clears throat> but a big part of that was like i was a super shy kid especially at school like i was picked on i was bullied so like school is not a fun place for me to be um, didn't like it at all. But then going to trampoline, like I had, I was a good trampoline athlete. I was talented. I worked hard. I had friends. We all connected over the same thing. So, you know, I wasn't picked on. I wasn't bullied. It was like a purely positive space to be. It was very night and day. So even though there was a lot to do between school and trampoline, it was like school's the crappy thing I have to do during the day, but then trampoline's the awesome thing I get to do at night. So that was like a, a really big break for my you know, a really big boost for my confidence. It helped to, you know, keep me sort of more mentally healthy for school and all the other things that I had to do. But, you know, trampoline was like the one thing that I loved to do at the time and, you know, made a really positive impact on me. Yeah. It's pretty quiet now. I'm not sure if anyone else has any questions. Yeah. I think <laughs> covered a lot of ground here. This is great. Anyone else? Yeah. I think we're, we're pretty quiet now, so I think uh, <laughs> that, uh, anyways, I, on behalf of the gym, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to everyone.